Good morning, everyone. We are continuing on in our series entitled Pulling Weeds. We, uh, we opened the year with a series where we talked about, hey, how to have a fruitful year. Well, this series talks about some things we got to get rid of in our lives if we're going to have a fruitful year. These are things that can just get, just drain all the love and joy and peace that God wants us to have in our lives right out of our lives. And today with Valentine's Day coming up, we thought it'd be a good idea to talk about something we need to get rid of in our lives, a bunch of things that we need to get rid of if we're going to have love and joy and peace, all the things God wants us to have in our relationships, we're dating or we're through marriage. And so my wife, Debbie, is joining me today. Hey, Deb. Good morning. Good morning, and, uh, everybody. And so we're going to talk about eight little pests, little foxes, if you will, that can really do harm to our relationships if we don't uh, address them. And so if you're wondering, hey, well, where do you get this idea of getting rid of little foxes? Well, I want to show you. It's under point A in your message notes. And if you're watching us online, go to centeringlives.com. You can download the notes there. But if you and I want our dating and marriage relationships to be fruitful, we need to remove potential threats that are often overlooked. So to remind us again, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And Debbie, these are things we want in our marriage. There are things I want in my home too. So this pertain, if we pursue those things, it can transform your whole home life. Yeah, but if we don't deal with some of these problems, oh, they can cause a lot of damage. Here's where we get the title from. Catch all, so verse of the day, Song of Solomon 2.15, catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of love, for the grapevines are blossoming. Song of Solomon was Solomon's greatest hit, best love poem he'd ever written, best love song he'd ever written. And this line comes out of that, and it's a poetic way of saying, if you don't deal with little problems while they're still small, they can grow into huge problems that can ruin the whole relationship. I mean, their relationship, the grapevines were blossoming, their love was growing and flourishing, and they wanted to have fruit in that relationship. Well, little foxes could ruin that. Most of us don't have vineyards, or uh, we certainly don't understand how they were doing things in those days, but in Bible times, they would have a vineyard, and they'd surround it by a rock wall. They would pick up stones out of the fields and other things and mortar, uh, make mortar and put together a stone fence all the way around it to keep cattle and sheep and goats and all kinds of predators out of your vineyard so they wouldn't just eat up all the grapevines, obviously. But there would be little cracks in there, and little foxes could get in there. And when the grapevines blossom, right, when they are just pollinating, they give off a sweet aroma. And these little foxes would get in there. And if they eat that little blossom before the, uh, the chance before the clusters have a chance to set, well, one little fox can just eat up all these little blossoms and then huge clusters of grapes won't grow there. One little fox can do massive damage if you leave it unchecked. And so the whole story is, hey, let's grab these problems while they're small. And you and I have found this is that if we deal with problems when they're small, it's a whole lot easier than grabbing them when they're big. Yeah, because a lot of these, when you go through them, they're going to seem like, well, that, that's a big deal. That's a big problem. Well, they start out small, but if you can um, address them when they're little, then maybe they don't get so big. So we're going to, as we go through this, we're going to be talking about, okay, how would you address this if you're married? How would you address it if you're dating? Because these apply to relationships and not just to dating and marriage relationships. These are true in relationships all over the place, but they certainly are true here. Would you pray for us? Of course. Let's pray. Holy Father, I just uh, thank you that you are here and you are pleased that we are here. I pray that you would speak to us this morning. Thank you that your word never returns void. It always accomplishes what you want it to accomplish. So Lord, teach us, encourage us, speak to us. Lord, we want to hear from you today. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. So eight little foxes we're going to talk about here. First one is this, not dealing with conflicts in a timely manner not dealing with conflicts in a timely manner. It might seem like something we could overlook. Well, you know, we'll kick the can down the road. We'll deal with it later. But if you and I allow conflicts to pile up, I think you can see how this could be a problem. Would you read that uh, verse for us, Deb? Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. And this is so, so important. I know when we first got married, uh, just in my immaturity, I thought that I would 
be a better Christian if I didn't bring things up that were problems, so that if you didn't talk about problems, then maybe magically you didn't have problems. I don't know. But um, it was silly because what I would do is I would step things down and then I would get really angry and not even know why a lot of times because I hadn't dealt with it when it first came up. So yeah, timely was, I, manner is important. I was just nodding. Yeah. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, Man, the and, truth and works, he, it? yeah, because here's why this all matters too, is because in Hebrews 12, 15, it says, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. I mean, if you have a poisonous root, you're going to get poisonous fruit. And if I, if we don't deal with anger and deal with problems in a short and timely manner, something close, Man, that anger, if it sticks around, it turns to bitterness. It's not more righteous to not address things, to just be quiet. Uh, there's a scripture in James that says, to him who knows what he should do and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. So when you know something is really wrong or when you know something could be a potential problem, you need to address it. Yeah, and this is just setting a time and place where you can talk about things and work it out and come to an understanding. How are we going to avoid this in the future? And that really transformed our relationship when we started doing that. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it did. That's a little fox. And I think you can understand, too, we've known people that, my goodness, they had things that started stacking up the first year of marriage. Let's say you had one every month. Well, in 10 years, you have 120 issues that haven't been dealt with. 20 years, you have 250. And we've known people. It's all of a sudden, it's like, you know, we, our kids went to school with these folks. And here they are 20, 25 years into marriage. And all of a sudden, they're getting a divorce. And they've got this mountain of unresolved conflict. It's too hard. Well, if we catch them one at a time, we don't have foxes running all over the vineyard, destroying everything. Second little fox, thinking we can fix or change each other. That's a bad idea, right? That is a bad idea. Nobody wants to be fixed. Nobody wants to go into a relationship, um, a dating relationship or a marriage, um, having someone someone's goal is to change you. I mean, that's a terrible idea. Yeah, I mean, listen to this scripture, Proverbs 21, 19, better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. Man, the Bible is so strong on it's some things, isn't it? It's always the wife. I mean, why is it always the wife? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, look, wives don't have the corner of the market on this. Thank I mean, you, you understand how this goes. Hey, why can't, when are you ever going to lose weight? When are you going to get a better job? When are you going back to school? Why can't, be like, why can't you be like your brother? Why can't be, you be like your mom? Don't you just feel the love and joy and peace? Yikes. I mean, there's no love and joy and peace. I like that next verse better. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. First Thessalonians 5.11. Oh, yeah. That's what God wants us to do. Hey, I mean, if, if this is important to you, how can I help you? I'm praying for you. I mean, I love praying for you and saying, hey, what, how can I help you achieve your goals? Yeah, because all of us have issues. But um, if I love him and he loves me, then I want him praying for me. And why can't we just talk about it and say, oh, I, it would really help me if you would do this to help me in that and pray for me. And that's a godly response. And that's helpful. Oh, yeah. But if you go and if you're dating and somebody, you get the idea that you're dating somebody and they're constantly trying to change you. I mean, that was one of the things when our boys, when they talked to me about, to Debbie and I, about our daughters-in-law, the women they eventually married. It's like, man, one of the things we need to know is can they accept our boys for who they are? And they accepted our family. For and who can we they are. accept us and just say, hey, this is who we are and not try to go around changing everybody because it's just, oh, it just steals all the joy out of our relationship. Now, look, it's also important, even as we say this, I do want you to understand, though, that the Bible does tell us that God is changing us to make us more like Jesus. He is using our marriages and our dating relationships to change us. So it's not me trying to change you into what I think you need to be. It's me praying for you, saying God would use our marriage to change, help Debbie become more like you, and you praying for me, and we both of us praying for each other. It's, um, Romans 8, Paul talks about this. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, to be made like Jesus, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. I mean, this is what's going on. 
God uses our marriages to teach us a whole lot about our own selfishness and how to be generous and kind. All those things about being patient and kind and forgiving. Well, these are things God, a lot of the stuff happens. This, our marriage is a laboratory for that. Yeah, it's, it takes time and it takes a lot of um, intentional work and intentional prayer. And we catch those little foxes and say, hey, we're not, I'm not trying to fix you. I'm praying for you. How can I pray for you today? Man, it makes a difference. Yeah. Thirdly, not admitting our part of the problems in the relationship. This is a little fox. It's like, you know, even if we're talking about stuff, can I, can I apologize and say I'm sorry? And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, hey, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye and then you'll see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Who said that? Jesus. John, this one is, is so very, very, very important. There's nothing more patronizing than having someone look at you when you've just told them that they hurt your feelings and they say something to the effect of, well, sorry you felt that way or sorry you reacted that way. And there's no um, admitting that they've done anything wrong. And it's nothing short of pride. That's all it is. It's just pride when you can't admit when you've sinned. You can't admit when you've done something hurtful towards someone else. All through Scripture, pride always was the, the sin that really brought people down. If you look at um, the Old Testament, you look at King Saul, the first king of Israel. He, every time he was confronted that God sent a prophet or someone to confront him in his sin, he would get all defensive and he justified everything that he did. And God eventually removed him from that position and brought in David who committed adultery, committed murder, but God said, this is a man after my own heart. And the difference was when David was confronted with his personal sin, he would fall on the ground before the Lord and he would weep. He would weep. In fact, there's a scripture in James that is so profound. It says, this is James 4, 9. Let there be tears for the wrong things you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Our sin harms our relationship with God. It harms our relationship with our spouse, with, well, actually anybody that we have a relationship with. We need to be humble enough to admit when we're wrong and ask for forgiveness and grieve and cry over our sin. It's humility is attractive in a person and it's um, God longs for us to grieve over our sin so that he can grow us. Look, relationships are messy at times. That's just the way it is. So we're gonna have conflict. That's part of every relationship. Sometimes it's 60, 40, 80, 20, 90, 10 split. It's not always gonna be 50, 50. But even if I'm on the 10 side of it, if I can acknowledge my part, oh, that goes a long way. I mean, when you are talking to, like when we're talking to each other and go, man, I really messed up. You sure did. Okay. That's one way to do it. Or it's like, yeah, I know. But you know, the way I handled that, that was wrong too. Oh, okay. Now you can tell we're both coming to the table here. We're trying to reconcile this, not prove who's smart or who's right. I didn't marry you to put you down anyway, or to, I mean, we're not trying to win here. We're trying to reconcile. And if you and I can catch those little foxes and say, hey, can I just admit my part? John, it's not about being perfect, but when you grieve over your sin, man, that, that does a lot in a relationship. Yeah, and so for those of you who are dating, if you are dating someone, can they admit when they're wrong? I mean. When you're dating them, people are going to be late. They're going to forget stuff and other things. When you talk to them about that, can they say, yeah, I'm sorry that hurt your feelings. I, I know that hurt your feelings. I'm sorry. If they never say they're sorry and never can admit they're wrong. Run that's for just... the hills. Fast. <laughs> okay, I was going to say maybe you need to rethink a few things. But we're talking about it. But okay, we'll go with that. Okay, so here's a uh, fourth, little, uh, fourth little fox not letting go of past offenses. Okay, I need to apologize when I'm wrong. I need to let go after the apology has been made and we've talked about this and worked it through. I can't keep hanging on to that stuff. Okay, this doesn't mean you don't address things. Don't miss that. It's people just supposed to let you get away with stuff. That's, 
That's not what we're talking about. That's not healthy in a relationship. But if you've talked about stuff and worked through it, then we don't need to keep talking about that a hundred times. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. 1 Corinthians 13. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. I mean, if, I mean, you talk about robbing all the love and joy and peace. If every time we have a problem, okay, we'll talk about this, but I want to remind you that five years ago at Christmas, you did this. But I want to remind you. It's hard to move into the future when that keeps happening. Yeah, all the patience and kindness and goodness. Remember, that's what God wants for us. Ooh, that just gets drained. And so, well, I can forgive, but I can't forget. I mean, we hear people say that a lot. I heard somebody say that a couple days ago. It's like, really? Because um, as as a Christ follower, you know, God for, has forgotten all of my sins. It says he throws them as far as east is from west, and he remembers them no more. So that's the goal. So the goal is not to keep remembering the past. It's to let go of the past. And so when you struggle with that, it's not easy. But when those things come up in your, in your brain, stop and pray. God, help me forget that. Lord, I've forgiven them, and I want to fully forgive them. Would you bless them? And would you show me how to move past that? Just be honest with God and ask for him to heal you from some of those deep wounds that you have. Since God chose you to be the holy people that he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. I mean, we read a little bit ago from the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus was very clear. He said, when you pray, pray this way, one line in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And just so that nobody would miss that, after the Lord's Prayer, Jesus even says, let me reemphasize one point in here. If you don't forgive others for how they've sinned against you, your heavenly Father won't forgive your sins. Gulp. Man, Lord, forgive me. I know I've sinned against you 10 million times, but I am not going to forgive my spouse. We're misunderstanding something here. Jesus says, that's not the way this works. I came into this world to pay the penalty for sins. I've forgiven all your sins. Just pay it forward. Forgive, just as I've forgiven you. Fifth little fox, can you read that one? Not staying away from filthy content online or on TV. Um, Ephesians 5, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You know, it's so important that you... Um, work to keep your, um, your mind clear of all those things, those sinful thoughts, those obscene wor- words, those um, jokes, all those things. If you're thinking about them, there's a scripture that says out of the heart. The overflow of the heart. The overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you're taking it in, it's going to come out. And that's not who we want to be. No. And I mean, this is a very big deal. The reason I'm putting it as a little fox, a lot of times people go to me, oh, come on, I'm a mature Christian. It doesn't matter what I watch. It doesn't matter. I know Jesus. I can handle it. I, these are things that we can sometimes defend because we like watching certain things. Lots of couples look at porn together. It's no big deal. Don't buy into that. You and I were not saved to watch dirty movies until we go to heaven. There will be no dirty movies in heaven. None. Never be misled on this. In fact, Paul is very clear on this. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Can we read that verse together, please? Do not not be misled. misled. Bad Bad company company corrupts good good character. character. If you and I watch all kinds of filthy stuff and we're part of filthy jesting and allow conversations to be happening all around us and we just keep talking the way we used to talk, it doesn't take long for those old habits to sink in. And don't let anybody tell you, oh, come on now, TV doesn't impact us that way. Do you know that today in the Super Bowl for a 30-second ad, it's going to cost $7 million? 
Why? Well, John, that's a good investment. There's going to be 100 million people watching. And when people watch TV, they respond to it and go out and buy. So you mean what they see on TV impacts the way they think and act and, and live? Yes. But only the ads. <laughs> only the ads? I don't think so. Don't be misled. Well, then what's the goal? Well, Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. Don't watch dirty movies. Don't share filthy jokes. Don't look at porn. That's the customs of this world. No, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. If I want to have eyes only for my wife, why am I watching filthy movies where there's other women making me lust? Why would I do that? I, I don't want to. I want there to be love and joy and peace. I want there to be trust that I've got eyes only for you and you've only got eyes for me. I don't want outbursts of rage and filthy talk coming out of my mouth. Well, then why would I watch shows where the whole thing is outbursts of rage and filthy talk? Now notice, it doesn't say, hey, you've got to do this in order to earn your way into heaven. Don't think that's what I'm saying. I'm not. That's not what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, look, you were saved from your filthy way of life. You used to live exactly that way. We all did. But you've been saved. You've been cleansed. Why would you go roll around in the mud again? Why would you go back to that filth? That's the point. And these are little foxes, and we don't need to defend it. We don't need to defend it. It's wrong. And that's what we're talking about. It. And you and I, this is something we've we worked hard on all these things. We've had to say, hey, this is what we're allowing in our house, haven't we? Yeah, if you feel the Holy Spirit convicting you, it's like, turn something off. Hmm. Walk out. Don't do that. And the love and the joy and the peace and the patience, all of those things that we desire will come if you're not grieving the Holy Spirit. These things grieve the Holy Spirit. And so you can't have both happening in your life at the same time. You've got to focus on the, the things that he tells us to be staying connected to him so that he can change the way you think. We've got a few more foxes to catch here. We've got to speed up. I'm, I, took a, I took a long time on that. Number six, six little fox here, not praying together, reading the Bible together, getting involved in a church. And look, y'all are here this morning. I'm so glad you're here. And those of you watching online, I'm glad you're watching online. But it's easy to say, ah, we're Christians. We don't need to go to church. We're Christians. We don't need to be in a small group. We're Christians. We don't need to pray together. We're Christians. We don't need to read the Bible. We're Christians. Won't make any difference. Well, let me remind you of something. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. You go, well, that, what's that got to do with anything? Well, this is something I remind people of all the time, whether you're a believer, whether you're an atheist or a person who's been a Christian for 50 years, you're making decisions. We're all making decisions about where, where we live, what we eat, who we marry, about the future, about the past. We all make decisions where we work, who we're going to date, who we're going to marry. We're all making decisions. How are you making those decisions? Well, they're going to be based on something. Your parents' advice, by what you read online, a professor in college, combination of all this. Well, you know what's so great is when you and I come to Christ, not only does he promise heaven someday for us, he promises to guide us this day. I mean, this is incredible. Jesus told the disciples, I'm going to go prepare a place in heaven for you, and I'll come back and get you when everything's ready. I'll come back. Don't worry. But while I'm gone, I'm going to ask our Heavenly Father, I'm going to ask my Heavenly Father to send the Holy Spirit to you. He won't just be with you. He'll be in you, and he'll guide you so we can make godly decisions. Well, the Holy Spirit speaks to us and guides us through the counsel of other Christians. That's church, small groups, through the counsel of God's word. That's the Bible, reading it every day, and through prayer, us talking to him. But if I don't pray, don't read the Bible, don't seek godly counsel from other Christians, then I'm on my own. He wants to guide us. He promises to guide us. If this is good news that you and I don't have to make decisions on our own, would you say amen? Amen. John, you know, when we first started dating, um, we would have conversations about spiritual things. We would read a scripture. We'd talk about it. We'd pray together. And that was such a new dimension to dating that for me. And it just, 
um, God blesses that. It gives you a depth to your relationship that you otherwise would never be able to have. God blesses that time. Now, with all this in mind, listen to Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The day is the day of Jesus' return. He is coming back when everything's ready. He may be coming tomorrow. But if he tarries another 10 years, why wouldn't I want to know what he thinks about money? Why wouldn't I want to know what he thinks about romance? Why wouldn't I want him to know what he thinks about kids and parenting and all the other things I go through in life? I do, and so do you. Well, then we need to avail ourselves of prayer, Bible study, and church. If you're dating someone and these things aren't important to them, they need to be. They need to be. Number seven, not uh, talking about finances. Last week, we did a whole message on how if we're chasing after the world standard of finances, man, that's like a weed that can just choke out our whole lives because it'll consume everything. Today, I just want to talk about the whole business, or Debbie and I want to talk about the whole thing that if you and I, I mean, a little fox can be not talking about those things in our relationship. I mean, Deb, read that Amos 3.3 3 verse. Can two people walk together without a green on the direction? Nope. <laughs> we got, uh, that's your comment on that? Okay. Well, yeah. anyway, no, we can't, but it's true. I mean, we have to talk about, hey, what are our financial goals? That's where we're going. What's our budget? That's our plan for getting there. Well, we don't talk about those things. How are we going to get to the same place? Or listen to this reference, Proverbs 27. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. Ridges don't endure forever. And a crown's not secure for all generations. You go, I don't have any flocks or herds. That doesn't apply to me. What it's saying is, have you checked your credit balance, your credit card statements lately? Have you gone through them line by line? Have you checked your uh, bank account balance? Have you guys talked about how much you're spending on eating out? Hmm, that's what that means. Where's your money going? When do you talk about these things? Sean, it's even important when you're dating. If you notice someone that just like, when they get upset, they just go spend a ton of money or they keep spending and spending and spending and you're thinking, wow, I didn't know their job could afford that. If, and if you talk about things, if they're, you know, just not even concerned, you know, that might be a red flag. Yeah, it's real important that we understand these things. By the way, if you need help with this, man, we still have at least a dozen spots in Financial Peace University. We talked about that last time. That's starting next week. And we've even had people offer scholarships to go. It only costs $79. Don't even let that be an excuse. We can help each other with Because the number one problem with couples is finances. Oh, yeah. The number one reason couples get divorced is arguing over money. Number one. This is a little fox. You don't talk about it, <whistles> can lead to big problems, ruin the whole harvest. Okay, number eight, not being intentional about fun or romance. You wanted this one in there. Why did you want that in there? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> um, just because this was um, a little issue when we first got married. Um, oh, yeah. If y'all don't know, John was an engineer before he um, became a preacher man. And he would, just the way he thinks is very um, engineer-like and not very romantic. And so we were a little challenged in that area. And so I remember in the beginning, we bought books and we read them. He even got a list of all these different creative things we could do on a date. And some of them were ridiculous and silly and we laughed, but some of them were very helpful. But it was nice to know that he was trying and it helped. If you are not intentional about laughing together, about doing things together, it's so easy to get caught up in life. And next thing you know, you're years down the road and you're just business partners or roommates or whatever, um, that you've lost a lot of that romance. And it's, you gotta be intentional about that. Yeah, he escorts me to the banquet hall. It's obvious how much he loves me. Song of Solomon 2.4. Get an idea that's not just going through the Chick-fil-A drive through line, don't you? I mean, there's a little more. <laughs> Let your wife be a fountain of blessing to you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. May you always be captivated by her love, Proverbs 5. And listen to this one, Song of Solomon 4, 9. You've captured my heart, my treasure, my bride. You hold it hostage with one glance of your eyes, with a single jewel of your necklace. 
Your love delights me, my treasure, my bride. Your love is better than wine, your perfume more fragrant than spices. Whoo, man. <laughs> Hallmark's got nothing on Song of Solomon. I am telling you, I didn't know anything about this. My mom was a tomboy growing up on a farm. I couldn't learn lessons of romance from my mom and my dad. They didn't, I mean, my mom, my wife was completely different from my mom. And I didn't know anything about it. Oh man, yeah, my first attempts at romance, it was a raging dumpster fire. It was terrible. <laughs> but we made a list of these things and, and then I would make a list and I'd try all these different creative dates and some of them were terrible and it's, yeah, it's just awful. But you even gave me credit for that because I tried. Yeah, it's important to try. In fact, we've talked about um, one of the ways to define romance is plan. Yeah, Just I tell people, guys something. all the time, hey, you want to know how, I, this is how my wife spells romance, P-L-A-N. Did you think about this at all? I mean, just showing up on Friday night, hey, where do you want to go out to dinner tonight? I mean, that's something. But what if I show up and say, hey, I've got something special planned for us tonight. I've been thinking about you all day. I mean, that's, that's amazing. I mean, that changes everything. <laughs> yeah, then I have to call 911 because he fainted. Or whatever. It's like, oh. Okay, a couple of things real quickly here. We're out of time. Okay, look, the vows of Christian marriage are designed to give us security so our spouses won't leave us when little foxes come. Yeah. I've talked about Jesus. I quoted Jesus here saying that since they're no longer two but one, no one should split us apart when Jesus is talking about marriage. The whole idea, when people a lot of times ask me, so if you're dating and people say, well, what's the difference? As long as we love each other, why do we need a ring? I mean, who cares? I mean, who cares? Well, you'll care. 10 years, 15 years in, and we got kids in common. We've got a house in common, car payments in common, but we got these little foxes. We got to work this through. Hey, you going to bring that up? No, I can't bring it up. What if she leaves? No, I can't bring it up. What if he leaves? There's no guarantee. There's no vow. Oh, yeah, that's why we do marriage, for better and for worse, because worse is coming, for richer and for poorer. Finances are going to be an issue sooner or later, and if you live long enough, the sickness and in health, and you get older, sickness becomes a part of it. John, it always gave me a sense of security knowing that we were committed to each other, that I could talk about a problem, I could share my heart, I could be upset, and we worked on it. And I didn't have to worry about him threatening to leave me. Yeah. That never even occurred to me or him. It's why we do premarital counseling here. It's why we go through the wedding ceremony. This is called wedlock. That's not a joke. It's where the name comes from. There's security here. Hardship's coming, but I'm never leaving you. Man. I mean, we exchanged rings. I'm not letting her out of the deal. <laughs> We're working on this. Let's yeah. work on it. Give me another chance. Let's work. That's the idea. The last one is, look, if you can't catch the little foxes, if we can't do it on our own, we should get help or advice. We have a marriage conference coming up in two weeks. If you need help with your marriage, come to the marriage conference. If you need to talk to somebody, call one of us. I mean, you'll see a couple of scriptures here. We're just out of time, but you can read those on your own. But I'm, I'm telling you guys, it's like, it's amazing to me how many times we go, oh yeah, but I don't want anybody to know we have problems. You can talk to anybody who's been married 20, 30 years. They've not only dealt with all of these little foxes, they've dealt with them multiple times because your life changes and at certain times you'll have more income and other times you're less. Sometimes you're busier and sometimes you're not. I mean, all of this, you have to go through it multiple times. I had people grab me on the way out after the first service and they said, oh man, you got to tell people this. You got to tell people this. You don't stay in marriage by not working at it. You got to work at it. The devil wants to destroy it. And it doesn't help to pretend that everything's perfect and you don't have problems. We can help each other. Yeah. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, I just thank you for your word. It's our guide in all matters of faith and practice. And God, how we practice our faith matters in marriage and dating. Every one of these topics matters. So Lord, I just pray that today that we listen to you. If God spoke to you about at least one of these things today while we were talking, 
just silently where you are, say, Lord, I'm glad you brought me here today. If God has given you a wonderful relationship with a husband, a wife, someone you're in love with and you're dating, thank him for that relationship right now. Pray that God will show you how to protect that relationship from little foxes that could spoil it. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen.